Okay, a couple things before getting back to talking about static electricity. The first is the, the third problem set is, is available and is due next class, Wednesday at 1. And a few of you over the past weeks have had trouble with uh, getting an error message saying problem could not be loaded. And latest word is if you switch browsers, go to a different browser or perhaps a different computer, try it again and that should clear the problem. Okay? So, um, the other thing, more, you know, other important thing to mention other than the problem set, the last of the, of the first set of three, first three problem sets, is the first exam is coming up. It's a week from today in class here. Uh, it's, you know, normally 50 minutes, although I usually let you all hang out till about the, uh, the hour. Uh, not many of you will need the full, the full 50 minutes or hour, but a few of you will. For preparation, I, I encourage you to take old exams. There are a whole bunch of them on, the web, on, on my website for, for 1060. Um, you could take old midterm ones from previous semesters, and there'll be a pretty good uh, preparation for the real thing. Uh, occasionally, different semesters I cover, I, I get to different points in the material, so you may have a question that's sort of in our future. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll get certainly as far as, by, by next week, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be somewhere in flashlights by the time uh, the exam comes around. So, um, so it's the first two chapters of, of the textbook and the, the first two-thirds of this current tenth, this is the tenth chapter in the textbook. Uh, what else about the, Oh, uh, to get access to the old exams. It's, I did password protect that section of the website. And the, the username is, is Virginia, and the password is physics, all lowercase. OK, so uh, if you forget it, it's on the, the front page for the Colab website for this class. Any questions about the exam, the problem set, any of that stuff? Yeah, better? The first two chapters and then the two-thirds of the textbook. So it'll be it will cover the first two chapters of the textbook, the basic laws of motion, basically, and the first two-thirds and a little bit more of the tenth chapter, which goes into flashlights. We'll be somewhere in flashlights, how flashlights work. Other questions? Okay, so what I was looking at last time, we're trying to give you an understanding of, of static electricity, which is something you, that you encounter uh, typically in the winter, more than anywhere else, things cling to each other, you get sparks jumping here and there. You know, what is this and where does it come from and how do you control it and so on. So to, to remind you, the, 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 the first sort of observations is our universe has electric charge in it. Um, it just does. The, the, the why, wherefore, that's beyond the physics, at least at this point. Uh, it turns out that it comes with certain subatomic particles, the, the constituents of ordinary stuff like us. Uh, for, for historical reasons having to do with Ben Franklin, uh, the electrons, which is the outer part of, of all atoms, and are actually the main, the main carrier of ordinary electricity and wires, electrons carry with them one fundamental unit of <coughs> negative charge. They are negatively charged, and they carry the, the smallest of available piece of, of electric charge, in that, uh, negative. Uh, the, the, the nuggets that are in the, the center of atoms, one of the constituents of the, of the nucleus of the atom is called a proton, and protons carry, they, they just come with one positive fundamental unit of, of electric charge. It's just the way matter is. There are some other uh, ex more exotic subatomic particles that carry electric charge too, but those are the two that, that, that dominate our world. Electrons with their one unit of negative charge, one fundamental unit of negative charge, and protons with their one fundamental unit of positive charge. And a question came in last time about, <laughs> did I get a haircut? Yes. <laughs> now I have more trouble having my hair stand up. Um, uh, about quarks. You may have heard, heard the name quarks other than by reading, is it Ulysses that has them? Um, other than reading James Joyce. Uh, it turns out that the proton, which for some period of time was thought to be a fundamental particle, or at least did, you know, 
that's all there is, uh, it was discovered that the proton actually has structure inside it. It's not, a, it's not the most basic unit. It's, a, it's, it's got constituents. And the constituents uh, are effectively, are, are these subatomic particles known as quarks. And quarks do carry char electric charges smaller than the, the, the fundamental unit of electric charge. They carry a third or two thirds of that charge. Uh, and they show up in, typically in trios. In the, in, the, in the proton, there are three of them. I mean, this is beyond the scope of the class. I'm not, I'm not gonna go into quarks beyond what I'm saying right now or, or expect you to understand it. Um, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't deeply understand the, the structure of the proton. There are people in the department who, who study this in, in great measure, but it's complicated what's inside a proton, but they do contain constituents that are, nom are normally assigned uh, felt to have fractional charge, a third and two thirds, and minus a third and minus two thirds. And s so there are smaller portions of electric charge around in our universe than the fundamental unit of electric charge. The problem is you can't get a quark out by itself um, for, for very sort of basic fundamental reasons. Uh, it wasn't clear that, that was the case you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I, in graduate school, I was actually involved in an experiment looking for free quarks for a, for a while until, for, for a long story, until I stopped. Uh, it was never successful. No one has ever observed a free quark. And therefore, no one's ever observed a free one-third fundamental charge or, or two-thirds fundamental charge. They are, they are just bound into the things like protons to the point where you can never get one of the quarks out by itself. All right, so our world has these uh, particles that are charged with one unit or two units of the, the fundamental units. They're very, the fundamental unit of electric charge is tiny. Uh, it takes an awful lot of them together to be noticeable in most, except in specialized experiments. And so the, the amount of fundamental units of electric charge that you normally see, say, in, a, in, in the spark that you get when you accidentally build up charge and touch somebody or something. I mean, you're looking at, at, at trillions of fundamental units of electric charge making the move. So the, the basic units are, are, are mostly hidden, that fundamental unit. Okay. Charge is a, is a conserved quantity in our universe. Again, it's an observed uh, situation, um, no one has ever seen a failure in the conservation of electric charge, where, where additional positive charge, for example, just showed up in isolation. Just, there's more. Where did it come from? Uh, it, in every case, it came from somewhere else. So electric charge is a conserved quantity. You can have positive amounts of it, which we call positive charge, and you could have negative amounts of it. It's a quantity that, that, that goes bo in both directions, above and below zero. And if you've got less than zero uh, electric charge, that we call negative charge. So electron, an electron has less than, than zero electric charge. It's negative. And another important observation about electric charge, and probably maybe the important one that, that for, for, for our everyday experiences is, is electric charge exerts forces on electric charge. Uh, these forces are not gravity. They're not, uh, they're, they're just a new force, a, just a new in this class in, in a sense. They're the forces between elect, electric charges. Um, they're, they're, they can be called electrostatic forces, the forces between stationary electric charges. But as we'll see there, overall, the forces between electric charges are part of a, of a team structure that, that's the world of electricity and magnetism. Elect, electricity and magnetism are not completely separate stories. I'm going to talk about electricity first, I'll talk about magnetism second, and then we'll discover, oh, they're related. And so th things that are electric, things that are magnetic, they push, on, push and pull on each other, all with the same sort of group of forces that are all connected in together. The observation with electric charge is that, that like charges repel, they push apart. So if you have two positive charges, you know, here we go, two positive charges, you bring them close to each other, they, they will experience forces that push them in opposite, uh, uh, push them away from each other. Uh, as always, forces come in equal and opposite pairs. So this, this charge will cause this charge to be pushed 
to your right, and the charge on your right will cause the charge on your left, I'm, you know, I'm doing the reverse here, uh, to be pushed to your left. So they both push each other, and it's, it's, a, it's repulsive. And the forces get stronger as the charges get closer. It turns out they get, they get stronger in proportion to one over their separation distance squared. It's a, uh, the jargon for that is it's an inverse square law, meaning that if you have the distance between these two, two charges, they're now, they're now only half as far apart. You square that, you get a one over four. The force goes up as one over four. Ugh. Don't, don't write that down. Um, that's, you, you, you have the distance, the force goes up as, I don't even know how to say this right. It doesn't just double, it quadruples. Let me leave it at that. The force goes up much more, much faster than in proportion to the one over how far they're apart. So it get, they get repulsive fast. The same is true for two negative charges. So if you have less than no charge on two objects, they are negatively charged, they repel also, and the force also gets much stronger as they get closer, so they're both pushing apart. And the last possibility da -da -da, is you have opposite charges. Opposites attract, you know, the fame, you know these, these expressions, they actually make sense in the world of physics, they probably originated there. And in this case, these two charges being opposite attract one another, they pull together, and again the force gets stronger as they get closer, and it goes, the force goes as one over the distance squared. All right? Do I care whether you remember the distance, one over distance squared? Not particularly, but just, it is important that they get, they get stronger as they get closer. Uh, that gave rise to certain important effects. For example, I, I showed you that, that a, a charge brought up to a surface, like a charged balloon, will just stick to the surface. You know, how did that happen? It's because it gets the charge, it, that, that charged balloon gets the charges in the wall, which are there, because the wall is composed of things that include electrons and protons, uh, it causes those charges in the wall to shift very slightly. If the balloon was negatively charged, and it would cause all the negative charges in the wall to, 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 to try to get a little farther away. And they, in getting a little farther away, they're still repelled, but they're not a, re, as repelled as much as they would be if they'd stayed put. So the repulsion goes down a little bit. And the positive charges in the wall try to get a little closer to the negatively charged balloon. They're attracted. So they, they scoot over a little bit, and the attraction gets a little stronger than it would be if, the electron, if, if everybody stayed put. So the repulsion gets a little weaker, the attraction gets a little stronger, there's an overall net attraction. And the, and the, the, the electrically charged balloon stuck to the, to the wall. And this is just a general uh, observation. Whenever you have a charged object near some surface of any sort that, that is electrically neutral, the charged object tr tries to cling. It, it polarizes the neutral object. And, and neutral, I'm using the word casually without in, introducing. Neutral means zero net charge. So if it's neutral, your hand, for example, you, you know, candy wrapper, you take the candy wrapper, it clings to your hand. You can't get it off your hand. Why is that? It's because it, the candy wrapper has a charge on it, and it has polarized your hand so that your hand is now attractive to it. And you gotta get it loose, or, or styrofoam. The styrofoam packing stuff is just a nasty nuisance because it gets charged very easily and then it sticks to everything. All right. Where I sort of finished off, and what I'll come back to approximately, is as you start to accumulate electric charge of one type, pick one. Um, I'm going to pick, let, before I accumulate it, two cents about, about Ben Franklin's unfortunate choice. Ben Franklin was playing with electric charge. He was, you, you think of him as, as, a, as a states person or something like that, or, or writing Poor Richard's Almanac and all that stuff. Uh, and may, okay, and maybe flying a kite in the thunderstorm, but he was actually the foremost uh, scientist, basically, in the colonies of his, of his era. He was, he was busy, busy, and he was uh, very, he, he really liked playing with static electricity. Uh, he electrocuted a lot of turkeys, which is kind of grim, but okay, he did it. 
Uh, and he came up with the idea of, he also invented the, the lightning rod, which we'll see how it works shortly. Um, he came up with the idea of naming charge positive and negative, and he had to pick one to be positive and one to be negative. He, and people were aware for some period of time, and I don't know, how, I'm not a good historian of science, when, when people finally figured out that electric charge exists at all, and when they figured out that there's both a po there are two types, one, you know, likes and opposites, and they, they attract and they repel, you know, that stuff. Some, people, people were aware of this stuff, but I think it was, it was Franklin who decided, okay, let's call one of these positive, one of these negative, and work with it from there. And this ultimately uh, come, was, a, was a good choice because it's one conserved quantity that you have positive amounts of and negative amounts of. But he made it the choice to call whatever it is that, I think it's on amber when rubbed with like cat's wool or something, or fur or something like that. He, he decided that's going to be positive, and another one, whatever you get it by rubbing this on that, you, that's going to be negative. And unfortunately, his choice means that electrons have a negative charge. The thing that he decided to call negative was a thing that was decorated with electrons. Rah! Why is that a bad choice? It's because it means that so many things where we talk about charge moving around, it's negative amounts of it moving around. We have to move, the, what, uh, wires are carrying a negative amount of charge through them it, as a current of negative charge. Ah, what a pain in the neck. It is my analogy for this, I love analogies of course, is like suppose we decided to make an economic system. We're all gonna, gonna pass money around, but all the money's gonna be printed in negative denominations. So when you go to a store and you want to buy a candy bar, you, you, you get the candy bar and the cashier gives you a negative $1 bill. Transaction complete. Your, your wealth goes down by $1, the cashier's goes up by $1. It all works. You can do that. You can have an economic system. You can make Venmo, negative Venmo, Nenmo. Um, but it, it's such a nuisance. Yes, it mathematically works out, but it's just a pain in the neck. So, okay, so it's, we, we live with this. Uh, you will see it come up periodically. For the most part, we're going to make fictions that we're going we're to pretend we don't know about electrons and, and everything's going to be positive charge moving around. Life is going to be simple. But occasionally, we're going to have to look under the hood and realize, oh, it's negative charge moving. All right, so this, this, this thing, it's called the Von de Graaff generator. It accumulates huge amounts of negative charge. Yeah, that's life. Okay, and the, the, re the reason I'm, where I'm going with this is what this device does, it's got a rubber belt that is, does not carry electricity. We'll, we'll see very shortly about insulators and conductors. Some materials allow charge to move freely within them, and some materials do not. And everything in this structure from, the, from the, the, this aluminum base to this aluminum ball, all this, is con consists of electrical insulators. They do not allow charge to move around on, in them. The belt, however, actually moves. And so the machine down here puts electrons on the surface of that belt, the, the little negatively charged guys, and the belt carries them against their will. They're kicking and screaming the whole way. It carries them all the way up to the top into that aluminum ball. And when they get there, they go to the outside of the ball for reasons I'll show you in a minute. And so this is just an endless system of carrying electrons, negatively charged guys, from the base to the ball and dropping them off. So they just accumulate like, like crazy up there. And that tremendous accumulation of negative charge means that they're all the, the little negative charges sitting on that surface are just very unhappy. They're very close to other electric, other negative charges. They're all repelling like crazy. And one symptom of this is that you put your hand nearby and they say, you know, great, there's an opportunity to leave, and they leave right through the air by way of a, of a, of a spark, which I've got to deal with shortly. And the ball suddenly loses a whole lot of, of the electrons. Um, I, you know, I get, I get a nice shock, and then uh, the, 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 the system resumes, right? You know, so, so they're going. Uh, the belt is doing work pushing them up. They hate it. 
the, the belt has to shove them up. So the belt actually slowed down between when I first turned it on and now. And if I let them escape, it'll speed up again because it'll, it'll, so they're coming. Can you, see, can, you, can you see or hear the belt speed up? I'm letting the charges escape. And now I'll let them accumulate. The belt's going, oh, and the motor, oh, it's getting hard again here. Ah. Hey, you can feel my hair go. Is it better this time? All right. I got so many, so many shocks in my youth playing in my basement. You know, I dance around half the time. All right. I guess that's not very politically correct. Sorry. All right. Uh, a few things that, that, that we, we need to make clear here, that, you know, how that thing's working. Well, the electrons are being carried up there. Why don't they just get carried right back down on the other side? Why do they stay on the ball? And um, that's an interesting question that we have to address. The other question we have to address is how did you get the electrons onto that belt in the first place? Uh, let me do it in the, 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 start with the second question first. You know, how did you get the charges on that belt? And toward that end, here's a question I will ask you guys. And it is, if, you, if you start with two neutral objects, for example, the rubber belt and, the, and there's a piece of metal near the rubber belt, those two, do they have to rub across one another to, ex to exchange charge? Or you know, do they have to rub? Do they have to actually do sliding friction? You okay with the question? And it's, where's the, where's the widget? Of course, didn't come up. Sorry. Why the, why the clicker gadget is very slow, I'm not sure, but I'm, it's still working. I'll give you 10 seconds once it actually begins operating, because you will have had plenty of time to think. Finally. All right, put in your, put in your, your choices. Five, four, three, two, one. B, no it is. N no is yes, yes is no. Um, it actually, rubbing isn't the issue in, in building up static electricity. It sure seems that way. So I mean the reason to ask you that question is because it's, it, it's it, intuitively you, you, you think that the rubbing is crucial um, and it sure looks like rubbing was crucial when I'm doing this, trying to get I'm, this is now covered with negative charge, incidentally, and if I put the negative charge on this little, this little ball here, now they, now they hate each other, right? Ah, go away, go away. Um, was the rubbing actually important? It turns out, no, it's not a rubbing problem at all. And let me show you that. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I just have a piece of glass, it happens to be a beaker, but that's okay, and two pieces of tape, and I'm gonna put, I'm gonna do my best not to rub anything I'm just going to put the piece of tape on the glass. There's one piece on. And I'm going to put another piece of tape on the glass. On the glass. And I'm not going to rub. I'm just going to pat them onto the surface. So they're now stuck on the surface. I'm now going to peel them both off, hopefully once, one with each hand. Here they come. Ready? peeled off, and now, do they have an electric charge on them? Hopefully some of you can see this. They hate each other. In fact, that one wants to stick to my finger. 
It's definitely got charge all over it. And it's the same charge that the other piece of tape has. They both have the same charge. They will not touch. Nothing I can do will make them touch. So I pulled off like charge. I don't know whether this is positive or negative. I guess I can figure it out. I know that's negative in there. We can find out wh whether it's, yeah. Let's see what it is. It's negative. The, the little ball is, is saying, go away, go away, we hate you. OK, so the piece of tape acquired negative charge. It, it stole it from somewhere else. It did not make negative charge. It stole it from the, the beaker. That means that piece of glass here should have positive charge on its surface. Let me see where I can detect that. Yes. The piece of tape is being attracted to the, to the beaker. I don't, again, in, you know, it's, in a big classroom, it's hard to see that's the case. That beaker has, has positive charge on its surface. So long and short of it is putting the tape on the glass and pulling the tape off was all it took. The, the tape came off with negative charge on it and left positive charge on the, behind on the glass. So. Where, you know, what's going on? It turns out that you know, atoms and molecules, surely you've heard, are, are, are built out of atomic nucleus and electrons on the outside and stuff like that. And a normal, a normal atoms and most normal molecules are electrically neutral. But if you bring atoms and molecules together and, and touch them and then separate them, it's possible for certain groups of atoms and molecules to be so eager to have electrons that they will steal them from another group. And that's what, what happened here, is that basically the tapes, the chemicals that are the tape sticky stuff, were so aggressive at wanting electrons that they stole them from the glass, st the structure of the glass molecules, the glass structure. So when the dust settled, the, the tape had extra electrons on it, and the glass was bereft of, you know, was missing electrons. And that happens all the time, that, that, that different chemicals fight, uh, have different affinities for electrons, and it's a chemical issue. Y even though you end up with positive charge on one side, negative charge on the other side, and that seems like it would, they would want to get together and, 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 and cancel, they don't. Chemically, they, they, it's, it's it's favorable for the chemicals to end up with a, with a net charge like that. And so tape likes to, evidently likes to steal electrons from glass. I know, for example, that Teflon loves to steal electrons from silk. It's not that they rub each other, it's that they touch at all. When they touch, that Teflon steals electrons chemically right then and there. The rubbing, what does it do? It just brings more Teflon and more silk into, into contact, gives them more opportunity for the theft to occur. OK? Um, for, for fun, there's another, another question I can do here, is what happens if I put, I'm not going to do it on the glass, actually. I'm going to do it in midair. I'm just going to take the two pieces of tape, and I'm going to stick one piece of tape onto the other. Right now, they should be pretty much electrically neutral. They are. And I'm going to stick one piece of tape onto the other most of the way. I don't want them to go too far. And now I'm going to peel them apart. So one of the pieces of tape brought its sticky surface against the other piece of tape's not sticky surface. It's not symmetric, right? One piece of tape is getting a different treatment than the other. Now I peel them apart. Will they attract or repel when I bring them together? You think about it. Not very, not very convincing. They're certainly not repelling, and they're actually just some hint they're attracting. The two tips do come together. Yeah, so it's attractive. One's got positive charge on it, one's got negative. Basically, I brought two neutral pieces of tape together. They fought unevenly over the electrons, and one piece of tape, I think it's the tape that the, where the sticky side was active, that one got more electrons, and the other one was lo lost electrons. So that's, 
So when all the story is over, it's sheer contact between or proximity between materials almost always causes some transfer charge. And one charge, one ends up positive charge, one's negative. And that's what's going on in this, in this belt system. Down there at the bottom, there's an opportunity for charge to be stolen by one surface, the rubber belt actually steals electrons from a metal piece in there. And now they're on the belt. And they ride the belt all the way up, up to the top, to the ball, where they accumulate. Okay, so we've got the, we've got the, the source of electrons down here is just, just simple, the sort, classic static electricity. The next thing we gotta look at is why do the electrons accumulate on the ball? Why don't they just go back down, uh, ride, the, ride the belt back down? And so, do I have this as a question? No, I don't have it as a question, it's okay. All right, sometimes I do this. I wanna show you two gadgets, let me get this guy out of the way, I don't need it right now. This device, it's just called an electroscope. I know things like it have been around for several hundred years. It has an, an isolated piece that has the ball on top. Down here at the bottom, and I think I probably can do the camera on that guy. Yeah, there, there, there you go. Okay. So it, it's just got a rotating vein, a, a vein in there that, that can rotate. And if I put electric charge, either positive or negative, on the ball, it will also go on to this structure down here, and the vein and the structure will push apart because like charge repels. So, he, so, so this is a very sensitive device for electric charge. Do I have electric charge on the, on the Teflon? Yes. Uh, yeah, and it, it should really stay there until I take away that electric charge with my hand. I'll let it escape into me. Okay, so you can see electric charge. The reason I wanted that is because I want to show you where electric charge goes. And now I have this, the problem. Well, I want to come back full screen here. I'm gonna put electric charge all over this, this little bucket. It's just a can, like, like, a, like a soda can with no lid. And I'm gonna, it is the case I'm gonna work with negative charge because I can get a lot of it. This is very good at making electric charge. I'm gonna sprinkle it on the can, in the can. The can is sitting on a piece of plastic that does not allow electric charges to move through it. It is an insulator, electric insulator. I need to sort of show you more about electric insulators, but you can take my word for it. Electric, the charges I'm sprinkling on this can and in the can all that can't go anywhere except stay in the can. The question now is, where are they in the can? Are they on the outside of the can, the inside of the can, or both? And that I would ask you that as a question if I had it as a question, but I don't. So you, you, you okay with that idea of a question? They could be on the outside, they could be on the inside of the can, they could be both. Let's go look. So the way I'm gonna look is with a, just a transfer ball. This, this is also an insulated ball. I'm gonna see whether charges go onto this, negative charges, and then with that I can check the electroscope to see whether they're on here. So I'm gonna go looking for charges. It's, it's in, also insulated. I'm gonna go looking for charges first inside the can. Go right through the bottom. The open part. I'll touch, swirl around a little bit, collect and collect and collect, and I'll come out carefully. Are there any charges on it? No. Nothing. Huh. I think, well, maybe he's just cheating, and maybe I am. We'll see. Let me go see whether there are charges on the outside. Yep. They're on the outside. Is that it? Okay, you understand what I just did and why? They really do go to the outside. The charges in an in a electrically conducting object like that, they go to the outside. They, they're never on the inside. Why? Because 
they can reduce their energy, their total potential energy, by going as far apart as possible. And so why would any of them hang out inside the can when they can do better? They can go through the walls of the can and hang out on the outside of the can. It's better. They're farther apart. Uh, this a general rule that I actually never really covered in class is that things accelerate in the direction that reduces their total potential energy as quickly as possible. Uh, stuff goes downhill. Stuff accelerates downhill because it can reduce its gravitational potential energy. Electrons accelerate out of the center of the can to the outside of the can because they can reduce their total potential energy. It's it's a general rule that if you can't find or, or tally up all the, elect, all the individual forces on objects, look at their, their potential energy. They will, if you, even if you can't figure out what, what all the, the, the forces are doing, you can, if you know the total energy available, potential energy, you can look for the way in which it can reduce its potential energy. Things like to fall over, um, go, roll downhill, and so on. Uh, it's not new physics, really, what it's just pointing out to you is, is there's a relationship between potential energy and forces. Of course there is, because potential energy is energy stored in forces. Anyway, so the, so, so the story here is that the charges in, a, inside a metal, in and around a metal container always go to the outside because that reduces their total potential energy as, as much as possible. Uh, for, for, for practical uses, if you want, if, if you're in a situation where there's electric charge around and you're worried about it, it's better to be inside a metal object than outside the metal object, because the charges will all be on the outside. In, given any, uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's still pretty good. So things like being inside a car is better than being outside a car when the car has lots of electric charge on it. For example, when it's hit by lightning, or when there's a, a loose wire has fallen off a tree, and it's, a tree fell over, the wire fell, and, and landed on the car, don't be outside the car touching it. Being inside the car touching it is probably OK. It's certainly better than being outside the car touching it, because the charge is not going to be on the inside of the car. It can do better. It can go on the outside. Is that OK? Uh, so where does that show up in this story? The charge being delivered into that Von de Graaff generator goes into the inside of a metal ball and is given the opportunity to go to the outside. And it goes, oh, yes, I love this. And it goes to the outside and it never comes back. And that's why it piles up on the outside. That's where it wants to be. Um, and when, having done that, it, can, it can't go back and the belt goes down empty. So the belt goes up full, comes down empty, and it keeps doing that until the charge on the outside of the, of the ball is so tremendous that something's got to give. And the, among the somethings that, that have got to give are the charge will just, uh, the repulsion gets so strong that the charge will just jump right off the surface and leap to, say, my finger. Um, it, does, it, it actually does involve the air. What it does to the air is it tears apart the, some of the air molecules. The air between, you know, what's happening when I'm doing this? Snap, snap, snap. You can hear it. I don't know if you can see it. Um, if I get close enough, they're, 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 I can certainly see the sparks now. What's happening, I'm all covered with charge. Um, what's happening in those cases is the air molecules that are drifting around into, into this area, they see negative charge up there like crazy. And for interesting reasons, they'll see there's positive charge on the other side. I polarize. That's negatively charged. If I go like this with my knuckle, what do you think is sitting on my, on my knuckle? Positive charge sucked up onto my knuckle by the attraction. So, so I'm polarized. There's positive charge here, negative charge there, and the air molecules in between are going, whoa. If we break apart, send, send the negative charge that, that's in one molecule that way and positive charge that way, um, this, this, uh, this is a good thing uh, energetically. It, it, it's allowed to happen. And you get this flow of positive charges going, uh, positive charges going to the ball and negative charges going to the, uh, to my finger, that's the spark. It's the, it's the torn apart air molecules um, in, that, in that in between. All right? So, 
what to do with the time I've got. What I wanna, what, what, where I'm going to go is, so this, this is static electricity. The, the sparks that you get when you're walking around and you accumulate charge by contact, your, your, the, 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 your shoes, for example, it depends what you're wearing on your shoes. As you're walking through a carpet, you will either pull off positive charge or negative charge. We don't know. Uh, if, it's if you've got rubber soles, it's, it's likely you're going to pull off negative charge. It's going to spread out on you as much as it possibly can. Why? Because it can reduce its energy by not being on your shoes exclusively, where it's all packed tightly together. It does better to spread out. You get farther apart. The energy goes down. And so it spreads out all over you. And now you're carrying charge on your fingers, all that stuff. You reach over to a doorknob, and you your fingers have lots of negative charge on them. The doorknob will soon acquire positive charge by the polarization trick. And they'll get very close, and the air will break down. Same idea again, where the, where the air begins to tear apart the molecules, and the positive goes one way, negative goes the other way, and you get a spark. I had something. Ah, ah. OK. I do have. So a couple things to, to, to do before, before leaving it. That's the world of static electricity so far. I do want to talk about voltage, because we'll need it shortly. But where, I, where I'm trying to get next is xerographic copiers, or someday it'll change entire, this topic. It could equivalently be laser printers. You know, how, do those, how do copiers and printers work? I'm, not, the, the, I'm, I'm excluding the inkjet printers, where you get the little cartridge that it puts in with color, and, and it, it literally spits little drops of ink onto the paper. That, that's interesting, but different physics. The, the physics of copiers, where they take toner, you, you buy the toner cartridges and stuff like that. What's toner? Uh, we'll see what it is. It's little teeny particles of, typically, of, of colored plastic. And the, the printer sticks those little particles of colored plastic onto paper using the forces that, between electric charges. It's, it's, all, it's all this physics, the, the physics of these electric, uh, electric charges, attractions, repulsions. But to get there, I need a few tools. And the first tool I want to talk about is voltage. And I mentioned it last time a little bit. And here's, here's, here's the story of what, what voltage is. You've heard voltage your whole life. What in the world is voltage? Voltage measures the energy per unit of charge at a location. It's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than I than, than ideally would, uh, would say. But let's look at the voltage of this, of this ball. And the voltage of the ball is how much energy a unit of positive charge would have if it were sitting on here. How much electrostatic potential energy would it have for one unit of electric charge? And the, the, the unit of electric charge, incidentally, I said it before, but I'll tell you again, is, is the Coulomb. It is way more than the fundamental unit of electric charge that's on a proton. It's the charge on something like 10 to the 19th protons, a lot of protons. But you have to have some way of measuring charge. So there's, there's this conventional unit, the, the Coulomb. So suppose there were one Coulomb on this ball and it had one joule of energy as electrostatic potential energy. We would say this ball has a voltage of one volt. It has one joule per coulomb of energy. Um, to, to give you another example that is useful, uh, the typical battery, the most familiar batteries, the, the, the uh, Double A or triple A or a D battery, you know those batteries, right? They're, they're described as a one and a half volt battery. What that means is that if you look at the energy on the, on the positive tip, if you, if you look at the energy per unit of charge on the positive, it is one and a half joules per coulomb higher than on the negative tip. Oh, that's not an easy thing to describe. Let's see. It means that if you put one coulomb of positive charge on the negative end of the battery, the battery will, rate, will, move, will do work on it, will pile it up on the positive tip, having given it one and a half joules of energy for every coulomb that made the trip. 
This is still very complicated. I, I, I'm trying to get a simple, simple answer for it. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get it much simpler today. I will, I'll keep working on this. But, but if we say that it, down here at the bottom of the box, where it's connected to the entire Earth, the energy that a Coulomb of electric charge has on the Earth is basically zero. No, no electrostatic potential energy at all. So its voltage is zero. This device moves charge such that, that by the time you get up here, a unit of electric charge up here, one Coulomb electric charge here, is a whole lot of electrostatic potential energy. And how much electrostatic potential energy does it have? Well, it depends on how many Coulombs are up there. So let's divide by the Coulombs and say every Coulomb has 100,000 joules of energy. If it's got 100,000 joules of energy for each Coulomb, that's 100,000 volts. Um, <laughs> it's a hard story to tell. This, so this, and that, this is approximately the, the, the right range of the way the story works. This device actually does accumulate charge on the top up here, packs it so full of energy electrostatic potential energy, that every coulomb of charge up there has a lot of energy. How much? About 100,000 volts. The only awkward thing is, it's packing negative charge up there. So it has every unit of positive charge does not have 100,000 joules. It has negative 100,000 joules. It would love to be here, because positive charge loves negative charge. So this develops not 100,000 volts of positive, and I'll, I'll come back to this, because this is not, this is, this ball does not develop 100,000 volts. It develops minus 100,000 volts uh, because it's accumulating negative charge. So I have to give you that story better. But voltage is, where, where, I'll, where I'll take this and, and before leaving it, is voltage is analogous to pressure. If you think of water pressure, which is much easier to think of than, than electrical pressure, water pressure, if you have low pressure water, it doesn't have very much energy per drop. It can't do very much. But if you pressurize the water, say with an ordinary uh, water pressure in your faucet, it can do things. That pressure, associated with that pressure, is the ability of every drop of water to do something. And the more pressure there is, the more uh, each drop can do. Uh, if you go to a, a pressure washer, which has, so the, the pressure in, in, a, in a faucet is, a, for example, is 100 units. The unit I have in mind is the pound per square inch, PSI. Water pressure is about 100 PSI. The, the water pressure in a pressure washer is more like 2,000 PSI. It can do more. So it's got more energy per drop. And if you go to 20,000 PSI, now you have a water drill. They make machines that actually, water cutter, that actually can cut, they can cut metal, they can cut stone with water if you go to that kind of pressure. So, so the, the more pressure you have with water, the more it can do, the more energy it has per drop. The same thing's going on with voltage, or analogous. The, the higher the voltage you take positive charge, the more it can do the more energy it has per unit of charge. In, in effect, the more electrical pressure it has. And so by the time you get to this, it's got tremendous electrical pressure. It can go and jump on, on nearby objects, like my hand, uh, right through empty space, or nearly, you know, through the air. It actually is breaking down the air and causing the air to become electrically conducting for a moment. All right, I think that's, that is, what it is, and uh, I'll come back on Wednesday and, and uh, show you how this leads to xerographic copiers and laser printers.